I thought we've got loads of batteries here, so just in case. <laughs> was that to give you some energy? Right. So, um, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kieran Brown. I'm the uh, head of strategy here in Airbus. And uh, what I'd like to do over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is just talk about comfort without compromise. So you heard John talking a lot about the 18-inch seat. Well, unfortunately, I'll repeat that a few times as well. But we have to understand why. I mean, it's not that in Seattle everyone says, you know, let's just give those passengers a 17-inch seat. It's really interesting, and we'll just make it uh, a narrower seat just for the sake of it. It's not. There's a reason why uh, they have to, to compromise on comfort, and there's a reason why we don't have to compromise on comfort. So, in terms of economics, you saw the, uh, the strength of the Airbus product line in terms of its uh, market success. We have a great product in the A320 family, the 330, the 350s, and of course the A380s. All of which have superior economics, superior range, superior comfort to our competitors from, from Boeing. This chart, of course, you, you also just saw, but it's important to put them together to see that over a period of time that the Airbus family has remained consistent in delivering an 18-inch seat and in, in terms of the comfort that it delivers the passengers right from the days of the A300. It started with the A300, it goes through to the A320. The A330, of course, continued with the 18-inch seats. 350 continues that trend and the A380 exceeds, in most cases, the, uh, the trend of 18-inch seats. But it's not all about the economy class seats. There's a lot more to the cabin, as we know, uh, than just the economy class seat. When we go back in history and we look at what happened to the airplane cabins, back in the 70s, it was a two-class cabin. We had first class and we had economy. Then as time went by, business class was introduced. Business class was then uh, superseded, basically, the first class because first class and business class became more or less the same product. Then we had the introduction of aircraft like the A380 that offered the passengers uh, super first class type comfort. Then we moved from first class, business class, premium economy, and economy. And in fact, now we can have the addition of budget economy and uh, regular economy. So there's so many different, there are, as we heard this morning, there are three billion people that fly. There isn't just two classes that's going to match what those three billion people want. So with all those people flying, the airlines have to be able to adapt their cabins to be able to find the right product for the markets that they're serving. And this is where the Airbus cabin, with the flexibility that we offer, really comes to, uh, to its own. So if you look at the, 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 the way the aeroplanes have been configured, you can see just in this one chart that over time, just take business class, you'll see how it was more than acceptable to have 48-inch pitch in business class. Then 68-inch pitch uh, became the norm. Then soon after that, we had lifeline seats. Now we start to have privacy in, in business class as well. But one thing as journalists which I would ask you to look at is when you write your stories and you compare your seat counts of Airbus against Boeing, what you will tend to see, please read the small print, because when, you, when we issue our seat counts and when we issue our cabins, what we do is we take the latest generation of what the airlines are asking us to do. So when we issue something that, say, that says it's 300 seats, look at the fine print, because in those 300 seats it probably will have a four-class layout. If you looked at the same thing with our competitors from Boeing, what you'll see is that they still show in their standard material the business classes at 60 inches. That simply isn't the case today. Cabins have moved on. Now, there's a reason why they still stay with the old standards. They stay with the old standards because it suits them when it comes to showing the economics of the aircraft. Our aircraft are very modern. They keep up with the times and they offer the flexibility so that the airlines can choose the right cabin to meet the right market. As we said, three billion people, you can't get away with just one or two different products. We have several products in the Airbus family, and that's all achieved because of the flexibility that we give the passengers in our cabins. Premium economy was mentioned. Premium economy now really will become the trend because premium economy is, 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 is a comfort level that goes beyond that of first. If you take the yield that the, past, that the airlines can achieve through premium economy, if you take one as the, as the reference for the economy class, you can get anywhere between one and a half and two times the yield through premium economy. And passengers are willing to pay that on the long haul flights. You can get up to three or four times that yield 
in the business class and maybe five, six times that yield in first class. But there is a segment in the airplane market, in the airline business, that now starts to hit the premium economy market. And when you introduce the premium economy class into, into the airplanes, the Airbus aircraft can accommodate the premium economy in a much more efficient manner than that of a Boeing can. So taking the new modern standards of, of, the, of the airline industry and applying it to the, to the cabin sizes and the cabin definitions that we have, you'll see that the seat count then becomes much more tailored and much more specific to an Airbus airplane and much more efficient when you apply the new modern standards. So as I said, please, when you do your stories, look at the fine print, and if our competitors are showing you that their business class cabin is at 60 in pitch, they're doing that, not because they just forgot to update them, but they did it because their cabins aren't suited to the modern standards of the airline industry. So let's just go through the, through the various aircraft types and look at the, the way that the uh, comfort is not compromised on an Airbus airplane. So here we have the 320 family, 319, 320, 321. You saw this morning that uh, our sweet spot, of course, is between the 320 and the 321. The reason for that is that the size of the aircraft, the comfort of the aircraft, and the performance capabilities of the aircraft are able to deliver much more what the airlines need than, than those of the, of the 737. But whether we look at it from the 319 with a very significant uh, cash operating cost advantage, or the 321, we can see that the Airbus airplanes have that advantage. Why have we stopped selling the A319? It's not that the 319 or the 7377 or the C series is, is a poor aircraft in terms of the in terms of the overall efficiency, but when you take the fuel prices, you take the yields that the airlines have been able to achieve today, simply that size of aircraft uh, does not deliver the economics that the airlines need in terms of their return on investment. So the 319 sells mainly in its corporate jet. We sell some aircraft, Bhutan for example, we sell the A319 to Bhutan uh, to Drukhan because it has great performance capabilities. We sell it into Latin America because of its performance capabilities. But in terms of economics, it's the 320 and the 321 today that capture the lion's share of the market. But they do that, again, without compromising comfort. You've heard, of course, the story many times now that we're seven inches wider than the 737. We've put, eight, we've put an inch in every seat, we've put an inch in the aisle, and the passengers, of course, appreciate that when they fly the aeroplane. But it's not just about the seat width. You've heard a lot this morning about the seat width, but there's many more things to the A320 cabin that need to be taken into account. So, slimline seats, yes, Boeing and Airbus can both accommodate slimline seats. But when we put slimline seats in our aircraft, because we have larger doors, because we have a larger, uh, a higher uh, uh, exit rate for each one of those doors, the ability to accommodate those slimline seats gives us the ability to put more seats in the aeroplane for a given size of, of tube. We introduced the Space Flex into the, into the aeroplane. Space Flex is a combination of a lab and a, and a galley at the back of the aircraft. Yet, when we first came up with the concept, we assumed about 30% of the airlines would show an interest in our Space Flex concept. That 30% has now gone to probably 70, if not 80%. So as we go forward, the Space Flex concept is something that I think will be uh, more or less the standard in, in an Airbus aeroplane and it will be an, uh, a standard that will give us an advantage over the competition. Why does it give us an advantage? Well, I'll come up to that in a minute, but basically, that seven inches at the, at the, uh, in the main cabin of the aeroplane transfers right to the rear end of the aeroplane. In fact, we have more than seven inches when you get to the rear of the aircraft, and those additional inches allow us to do a combination of the lab and the galley, whereas Boeing tries to do it, but basically can't emulate it. The smart lab concept, so some people may want all the galley space at the back, but today we offer far too much space in the, in the labs in the A320s, so we've come up with a smart lab concept that gives you the same feel in terms of space, but uses a much smaller footprint in the aeroplane, allowing us then to transfer the saved inches into the, into the cabin space of the aeroplane, giving the passengers, not just more passengers, but actually transferring it into comfort as well. The, do, the new door ratings I mentioned already, if you look at the, the 737, you look at the A320 side on, what you'll see is that the door on the A320 is a much larger door than that on the 737. But up till a year or so ago, the uh, number of passengers that were deemed to be uh, allowed to uh, exit those doors in an emergency was the same. 
So we discussed with the uh, uh, aviation authorities, and what we found was that yes, you can actually get more passengers through the A320 go. In fact, the rules were that you could get more through the 737 go. That's only because they had an earlier certification standard. So just applying to the to the new certification standards and talking to the uh, authorities and just you know it's basic geometry at the end of the day. If you have a door that's 30 percent bigger, you're going to be able to move passengers in and out of that door much quicker than than on the on the competition. So we're able to push up the number of passengers. We're able to utilize the space in the cabin an awful lot better. And combining all of these things together, we're able to then to deliver a much more efficient cabin in the A320 without delivering without compromising as I said, on, on, on the comfort. I saw a, a few weeks ago, I don't know which one of you wrote it, maybe it wasn't in this room, but someone saying EasyJet is to squeeze six more passengers into the A320. So I took offense to the fact that you said squeeze, because we don't squeeze them in at all. What we actually do, at the rear of the aircraft, so I've talked about the space flex. Today, if, what you can see is that the, the rear of the A320 has seven trolleys in the back of the aircraft. Most of the airlines today don't offer a full service to the passengers. So you don't need seven trolleys in the back. In any case, we have four trolleys at the front. So we have too much galley in the A320 for most of the airline needs. So an airline like EasyJet says, well, we'll accept your space flex concept. So what they did is they get four trolleys instead of seven, and they still have their two labs. But the two labs move from the passenger uh, area of the airplane to the rear of the aircraft. Now, What's the average seat pitch? 29, 30-inch pitch at the moment. But the lab was occupying 36 inches of space. So what we've done is we've taken the two labs out of the main mm -hmm. part of the airplane. We've transferred them to the rear, combined it with the galley. The airline gets its four trolleys, gets four trolleys at the front, gets two labs at the back, and now it has 36 inches of space to play with. Those 36 inches, 30 of those, of those inches are occupied by a new row of seats but the other six inches are distributed to the other rows to give them more comfort. So to say we squeezed six more passengers into the airplane is wrong. We actually put six more passengers into the airplane and gave the airline and the passengers more comfort. Again, because of the wider fuselage, we're able to accommodate innovative products into the A320 family. So we saw from the, the charts that John put up that the A321 really does have no competition with the 737-9 MAX and the old 757. Those aircraft have narrow fuselages. The aircraft are flying today across the Atlantic. When you fly, fly across the Atlantic, especially those uh, overnight flights, you need to give the passengers some comfort. Now with the additional space that we have in the A321 or the A320, we're able to turn that space into comfort, into innovative products, so when the airlines come to configure the aircraft to do those ultra long haul missions in the A321, they not only are able to do it economically with a 30% less fuel saving, but they can also deliver a much more innovative, much more comfortable product, again, without compromising any comfort for the passengers. So moving on to the A330. So we saw when the 787, or they called it the 78E7 in those days, and the uh, Boeing executives went around the world saying that they're now going to deliver an airplane with the, the most comfortable cabin in the skies. Well, they, that was the original concept. They were going to put the interbreast seat in the 787, but very quickly what they discovered is that the 787 didn't deliver on the promises it had in terms of weight and fuel burn savings, and they had to go from interbreast to nine breast. Now let's look at why that's the case. So in fact, that's the reality of the of the Dreamliner, a nice, comfortable line of rest with a 16.7 seat. So the 330, an airplane that, that uh, was the predecessor, and everyone thought was the, was the most successful uh, uh, mid-range uh, wide-body aircraft. Boeing tried to beat it with the 787. They came out with the 8 breast 787. But when you put the economics up of the 787 against that of the of the A380, of A330, and especially the 330neo. What you find is that an eight abreast 787 simply cannot compete with an A330neo at, at eight abreast. So what did they have to do? They have to go to nine abreast. And even at nine abreast, they're not able to, to demonstrate a significant advantage versus the A330neo. So we delivered in terms of the performance of the A330neo, we delivered a 14% fuel burn improvement. 
we kept the aircraft at 80 breast. We can go to 90 breast. There are a few airlines in the world, Cebu Pacific, uh, AirAsia X, who fly the A330 uh, CEO and in the future the 330neo with 90 breast. But they do that, they have economics that are, totally, that are completely unmatchable by any aircraft in the white body category. Those 330neos with 90 breast and a 16.8 inch seat, and in fact, we're working now to deliver a 17 inch seat on the 330neo. If we can do that, and you get a 17 inch seat with economics that are just unmatchable by an aeroplane in, in the skies today. So, coming back to the 330, which are delivered mainly as a press, you can see that the only way for Boeing to catch us or even get close to us on the 330 NEO was to then change the configuration from an a press configuration as standard to a standard 9 press. And that's when they went from the comfortable 18 inches to the uncomfortable 17 inches. And that's what the compromise they had to make, and we didn't have to make it on the 330 NEO. On the 350, so 350s today against today's 777s, 25% fuel burn saving. The aircraft, again, doing extremely well in the marketplace. 350-900 is an airplane that cannot be matched with the 787-9. It's an airplane that has fewer seats. It's an airplane that has less range. 350-900 delivers everything it, it was promised to. You can see that the aircraft flying with Qatar Airways today is uh, meeting the specification in terms of weight and fuel burn. And of course, from a comfort point of view, the A350 is delivering on everything that the, the passengers and the airlines expected. Boeing, of course, had to launch the 777-9X in order to compete with us. But when they launched the 777-9X, what you have to remember is that about 70% of the airlines today who fly 777s fly them at 9, at nine abreast. Those 9 abreast airplanes are 18 plus, plus inch seats. When Boeing launches the 777-9X, they remove the 9 abreast to standard and they go to 10 abreast. There isn't magically uh, a huge amount of space in the cabin. They've created an inch here and an inch there in terms of the sidewall clearances, but they haven't been able to really deliver the comfort levels that are expected by the airline passengers today. So when you take a 777-9X, and again, this, these are the things as journalists think that you have to look at carefully when you look at the numbers that have been provided by a competition. What they will show, of course, is that the 777 sits there at uh, Tenebrist airplane. But if you want to do real apples for apples comparison, you have to show both airplanes at nine abreast. They will have a little bit more comfort at nine abreast, but still, the nine abreast to nine abreast com uh, comparison between an A350-1000 and a 777X will show you that the uh, 777X really does have no ability, has no ability to compete with our A350. So they have to go to the 10th seat, and if you look at what they have in terms of the cabin, yes, if we keep the 18 inch standard, that 10 seat has to be a 12 inch seat. That's not going to happen. So they will distribute the, uh, uh, the pain through the cabin and they'll make sure that everyone has to suffer. And then we all end up with 17 inch seats in the, in the 777-9X. As I said, 70% of today's airlines are flying with 9 abreast on the, on the 777. But when Boeing goes out there and markets the 777-9X to the customers, they don't even show, they don't even have the courage to show an iron breast aircraft. They have to show the airplane at 10 breast. And they don't do it because they think that the world deserves a centimeter seat. They do it because they know that that's the only way that they can compete with the A350, whether it be at the 900 or the 1000. So when you put the, um, the, the airplane in there at 10 breast, of course it increases the number of seats, so it improves the economics. But as I said, it's a necessity not a uh, desire of the airlines uh, asking for the uh, ten per seat. It's a necessity of work. <coughs> then we move on to the A318, and of course, when we come to the A318, what we see is that it's the it's the cabin that attracts passengers. Of course, the airline uh, loves the airplane for the economics and the size and its ability to take away the congestion. But the passengers love the airplane. They don't give a damn about congestion and everything else. What the passenger looks for, and I'm sure many of you have flown on the A3, what the passenger looks for is comfort. Whether that's in first class, whether that's in business class, whether now in premium economy or in economy class. The A380, with the size, with the volume that it has to offer, it delivers to the airlines the ability to create cabins that deliver comfort and efficiency in all classes. And what does that mean then when the airlines fly the aircraft? The air the airlines publish, of course, which aircraft type is on, the, on a particular route. And we've spoken to many airlines who fly the A380 and the 777. And what they tell us 
even though the aircrafts first began service in 2007, even though we're now uh, entering eight years of entry to service, the passengers still, when they make their bookings, they ask, is this an A380 or is it a 777? And if they see that there are flights close to each other, and uh, many airlines uh, in Asia will, will put, because of the time difference, they'll put, they'll put two aircraft uh, departing, uh, let's say Singapore coming into Europe, both aircraft will be departing within, let's say, an hour or two of each other because of the time zones and, the, and the, uh, trying to get into London or into Paris uh, at a convenient time to do the connections. They'll put an A380 and a 777 next to each other. But what, pas what the passenger will choose is the A380, and what the airline will, will notice is that they can charge a premium for that seat, and they can charge a premium for the A380 service. And at the same time, their load factors still are, 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 are very strong on the A380, with the average uh, exceeding 80 percent. We think the average load factor is probably uh, getting pretty close to 90 percent load factors on the A380. So when we put the A380 up now against the uh, against the 9X, again, why did Boeing go from nine abreast to ten abreast? They had to do it because if they stayed at nine abreast, the aircraft simply was not competitive. They had to put more seats in. They they had to squeeze. So that EasyJet story that talks about squeezing, it's not on the Airbus airplane. You squeeze it, you squeeze the, the, the passengers in onto the Boeing airplane with the, with the 10 abreast seating. So if they had stayed at 9 abreast, if they had kept it in their catalog as a 9 abreast seat, they simply would not have been competitive. So they had to put a 10, 10 abreast seat into the airplane. And going into 10 abreast, they're still not that competitive against the A380. So the A380 still delivers on range, it still delivers on economics, it still delivers on passenger comfort, and it gives the airlines the ability to distinguish between the various carriers, and it gives the airlines the ability to give the passengers basically what, what they want. So this is Nicole Kidman in the, in the A380. She's uh, launching the, uh, the Etihad residence uh, um, uh, product, which they, they put into service, and this is, of course, the ultimate when it comes to Super first class competes with private jets and it is um, uh, very accepted uh, by that level of passengers in terms of what they what they what they want when they fly the aircraft. You can't do that on a triple seven. You can't put these type of products on a triple seven. You can only do these type of products. So it's not just John and his 18 inch seat. In fact, John never sits in an 18 inch seat. <laughs> this is where John sits. And, and this is the product <laughs> that, that we deliver. So don't believe him when he keeps talking about these 18 inch seats. This is where he sits. You know, this, and, and if we're lucky to travel with him, then we sit with him as well. So, um, and this is where I sit. I sit in the economy class section. And if I know it's going to be a 787, then I take a salad because I know once I'm in that seat, anything can happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kieran. Very telling. Uh, How do I get away from my pictures? Not moving. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. Q and A. Right. Let's start. Uh, Tim from Okay. Yes. Hello, John. Thank you. Um, uh, you talked about the Triple Seven X sort of natural habitat being nine abreast, so they have to go to ten. Yeah. Um, so, what are the? Perhaps you showed it. My apologies if I. Yes. What are the seat mile cost comparisons between the A350 class Carson and the Tenor Brex 779X, given that that is what okay. is in the market? So I did show it in. You were obviously looking at your computer at the time and not looking at the screen. <laughs> but uh, no, what, I, I can't remember the exact numbers we showed there, but I think it's, it's almost 20% 20 20 plus if you do a 350, 1000 against a 779X at 9 abreast, 9 abreast. And then they improve by about 10 percent if they uh, if they move from nine abreast to ten abreast. So it's about it's, 10%. it's about 10 percent difference in in, in the seat cost here. And the reason why Tim you have that 10 percent difference is because you've got 40 tons difference on the takeoff weight. So when you look outside when you're having your tea and your coffee, what you'll see you see the A350s out there. They have carbon rings. They have carbon fuselage. They have of all the latest in systems, you put all those systems together and you compare it with the with the um, uh, with the triple seven nine X, you'll see about a forty ton difference. But the lightest aeroplane out there from a wide body, I should tell you, is the A three thirty, even with its old uh, metal rings and metal fuselage. 
Next question to our colleague from China. Uh, hi, it's um, Simon Lee from China. Well, basically, I've got a question on the base uh, AP super jumbo. Um, you say that we comfort uh, without compromise, but uh, we see a lot of the neurons are now starting to think about adding more seats on the um, x ray AP. So, how do you view like the future comfort, um, maybe outlook uh, on the super jumbos? I, I think it's what I said is that is there are three billion people out there who fly on airplanes every year. You take those three billion people, each one of those people, not each one, but there are big chunks of people that need particular models in terms of what they're expecting from the airlines in terms of passenger uh, comfort. So if you take the A380, what it allows the airlines to do, it allows the airlines to offer several different combinations of, of, of product. And what will be a good product for one airline is not necessarily a good product for another airline. So that's why there's no compromise. When you take an A380, you can put the residence, as we saw with Nicole Kidman flying, you can put that residence in the airplane because it fits. First of all, it delivers a high level of comfort. It also does it in an economic way because we have the space to accommodate it. But what you can't do is you can't do those products on, on, on the 777. You can't you may just use up too much space on a 777. You simply couldn't accommodate that type of product on a 777. And what happens on the 777 is you have to go to, to 10 abreast. It's not a question of offering 9 abreast or 10 abreast. So some airlines will want to put 11 abreast in the A380. And yes, they will be putting more seats into the airplane because that suits the market that they're, that they're addressing. But on the 777, whether it's a premium market or not a premium market, they have to put 10 abreast because without the 10 abreast, they, don't, they cannot deliver on the economics. So on the Airbus airplanes, you have the ability to give the passengers and the airlines what they want, and you're able to do it in an economic uh, manner. On the 777, you have to deliver an uncomfortable airplane because that's the only way that the economics work. Next question goes to Andrea Rossman. Andrea. Yeah, good morning. Uh, within the Asian region, what kind of potential demand are you seeing for used A380s once they start coming off the market from MRC Singapore? Well, we won't, I can't name the customers because that, that wouldn't be right well, for you to do so. I mean, what types of customers? I mean, obviously, you, it's not, you're not going to see cafe in Singapore. No, right? but you can look at some, um, uh, some of the low-cost, long-haul carriers in the Asian environment should start looking at A380s. Uh, because today, some of those low-cost airlines are doing uh, long-hauls with A330s. And those, those markets, as we see, are, are, are doubling. Those markets are getting to be... Uh, to go beyond the six hour flight that they were originally uh, designed for, or the airlines were designed for, they start to look beyond uh, the regional network and they start to see interesting uh, business models of flying longer haul um, uh, A380 groups with, with a higher density uh, seeking and delivering a very, very low cost uh, long haul market. But just to say that it's not just long haul, I should correct myself, actually, even within the region, if you find that you have the passenger uh, uh, demand to suit a high density A380. The A380 on a six hour flight actually delivers, as Enrix has found, delivers a very economic proposition, not just on a 14 hour flight, but on a six hour flight as well. It could be a three hour flight? Three hours, if you're looking for the optimum point on an A380, it's actually between six and eight hours. So three hours, uh, you would probably be better off with an A330 regional. But six to eight hours, then you reach the optimum point on an A380, and then you, it's quite a flat curve, but it'll take you out to 14 hours. But the actual optimum is, so it's, it's a, it's a U-shaped curve, and, and it comes out between six and eight hours. Thank With you. today's fuel prices. Right. Thank you. Next Sorry. question. Uh, I can give you that. I agree. Right. Uh, this is about A380 again. Yeah. Um, two questions here. One is that, uh, during the last two years, have you had uh, new customers of A380? That's one. It's not 10 years. Uh, has it been as the as the sales are concerned? Uh, in, in fact, it's, uh, if you look at the number of A380s that we said we would deliver over a 20-year period, and I'm not don't have the exact numbers, but we can talk about it later on. But it was probably around the, the business case for an A380 was when we launched the aircraft was about. But don't write the numbers down because I'll give you the exact numbers when we have a chance. But it was 700 plus airplanes. But in that 700 plus airplanes, there were about 400 aircraft which were of today's A380 size and capacity. Then we added on top of that, in the original business case, we said we'd have an A330 
AD freighter. We said we would have a A380 uh, long range and we would have an A380 stretch. So in those 700 odd numbers that we that we had in the original business case, about 400, low 400s was the current size of aircraft. Then you have the, the freighter, then you have the long range, and then you have the stretch. And what have we sold today? We've sold about, I think the number is 317 aircraft have been sold today. So if you say that, okay, we're at the 10 year point, and we've done 317 in the original business case for 400 and something, I'm not too worried about that. And actually the A380 will come into its own uh, even more as we go into, into the next decade. One, because of the, the cabin as we discussed, because once you introduce that fourth class into the airplane, you need the space on the A3D to accommodate those super first class uh, cabins. You need the space on the airplane to accommodate uh, the premium economy uh, cabin. You need the space on the airplane uh, to, 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 to deliver basically what the airlines are trying to deliver to their passengers. And you have to grow. So what happens to the average size of a 777 or the average size or even of the 350, as time goes by, the average size will actually come down because we're putting uh, more comfort into the airplanes. So we can accommodate that on our A380, the others can't accommodate it on, on their 777s. So the, so the A380 then becomes more in demand as we get towards 2020 and those products in the airplane begin to change. Thank you, Kira. The other question was about during the last two years, yeah. have you had any new customers? For uh, we've done a lot of sales activity, that's for sure. You have fair for rehab. Yes, yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi. just uh, to complement the 8318 LCC question, how many seats do you see in this uh, six to eight hour uh, high density? Uh, to, you know, we can go up to 850 something seats, but I don't propose, when you, when you look at the economics of how you would deliver a, uh, a, a LCC 8380, mm -hmm. going to 800 seats that isn't necessarily the best answer. You have, again, you have to utilize the cabin in the best way that the aircraft uh, will accommodate. And, and it's probably better to do some sort of an LCC business class uh, model and add on an economy class section. So that's sort of 600 to 650 passengers, uh, where you have a two class A380 doing six to eight hour flights is, is a pretty good proposition uh, to, to the airlines. Especially in the used aircraft scenario with a, uh, a, an attractive lease record. Okay. Thanks. Next question to Tim Robinson. <coughs> hi there. Uh, hi there. Uh, Tim Robinson, Aerospace. So, in previous innovation days, we had the uh, the fat seat uh, where it's, it's extra width. Yeah. Uh, you could pay for it. You had the swing seat, sort of theatre seat seating. Uh, so, are those are those now sort of dead completely? Or well, I don't. The the, the theatre seat never got off the ground. Okay. Um, the the fat seat. The airlines. I think one or two airlines are still showing some interest in it, but their problem is how do you how do you how do you manage the airplane once because if it's all down the cabin today you have a business class and you have an economy class and then you know there's a distinction between the two if it goes all the way down the cabin and someone's paid for a slim seat and ends up in a, in a in a big seat so there was a lot of uh, uh, debate about that there are some airlines that are actually choosing rather than put it in the aisle they actually put the the, the wider seat. Into the, into the center seat. So if they have to say, uh, you know, make the center seat a little bit more attractive, if, if one or two airlines have done that. On the A320, what you can do is you can you can actually choose what you want. On, so again, it's this, this business of comfort without compromise. On the 737, you have no choice. So yes, we can keep coming up with new ideas and new innovation on the A320 because we have that wider aircraft and we can give the airlines many, many different choices to, to how to accommodate their passengers. If you're on 737, you've got your 17 inch seat, you're stuck with it. Uh, on, on, on a related note, I was just, just uh, um, could we see some of this stuff from the A320, things like Space Flex, uh, Smart Lab, and the Slim Eye Seat go, go to wide bodies? You know? Absolutely, very good question. And uh, what we are doing at the moment is, is uh, I don't know if it's official or not, so I don't know whether I'm allowed to tell you. But, <laughs> but there are many ideas that are, are, are moving from the 320 into, even into the 350. Uh, when we market the aircraft today, uh, we, are, we market the more efficient uh, uh, galley at the, at the rear of the aircraft. Uh, when we look at uh, A380 cabins going forward, uh, yeah, we have airlines like Singapore Airlines taking, taking airplanes in 2017, new A380s. They will also modify aircraft that they already have 
and they're picking up on some of the ideas that we started off on the 320 and then we moved into, into the A380. But as I said, I don't know if we've mentioned that yet or whether we'll save that for the next innovation day. But how we transition some of these ideas from the 320 into the wide body aircraft, even on the A330 and the 330neo, a lot of the ideas in terms of space flex and so smart labs, in terms of galley usage, will be transferred onto the onto the um, onto the 330neo. And I can say it on the 330neo because when we when we launched the 330neo, we said we had a 14% uh, fuel burn per seat improvement, which accommodated nine additional seats. Those nine seats on the A330neo came from some of the ideas that we had on the on the same. Next question goes to the Times of India. Uh -huh. Hi, Dr. Rao. Hi. Um, so, uh, first question is the same as to Mr. Lee. I, I, was, I was. Sorry, yeah. I so, wasn't there, so you'll have to repeat yeah, the question. So, uh, you know, most of the big orders uh, since 2011 when Go Air ordered 72 have come from Indigo, you know, in the last four years. Yeah. Uh, now we have two new airlines which have come in. We have, uh, the ministry has given six licenses. Yeah. When do you think the next round of big orders will come from these airlines? You know? not, not Indigo. What, what you forgot to mention is that even when the new airlines come in, if you could just remind the rest of the audience that they also chose the A320. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mentioned that, but yeah, again. <laughs> so, um, I mean, India today, if, if I can blow my own trumpet, is dominated by the bus. If you look at the uh, domestic market, it's like 80% of the domestic market. And if you look at the, the fact that Indigo has already signed an MOU for another 250 aircraft, when we, when we go forward, uh, that um, that market share will only go from strength to strength. And if we look at the new carriers that have, have, have got licenses in India, uh, AirAsia, India, for example, uh, uh, started with the A320. Uh, the one which we're very proud of is the Tata Singapore joint venture, which uh, Tata and Singapore Airlines both um, stand for um, quality. They both have a very strong brand and, uh, and images. And what they chose was the A320 because it delivered uh, the comfort uh, versus the 77 and did so with the economics that the airline expected. And um, so when we see, there is one more, which I can't discuss, you said mentioned six licenses. There's one more that has um, almost finished its evaluation. And we do hope that that will also be announced shortly, which they also have selected the A320. So the A320 has become more or less the standard uh, aircraft for the Indian skies. And if you look at John's charts where we see the Indian market growing, it sits there today with, uh, what did you say, 1 in 20 passenger people uh, uh, of the population flying. When it gets to 1 in 10 and 1 in 4, it'll be these airlines that will expand. And uh, you must have seen it in some previous presentations we do. There are many airlines that have gone from the 737 to the A320, but there's less than a handful of airlines in the world that have gone from a 320 back to a 737. So we're very confident that going forward we will maintain that uh, market share. Just, just one last thing. Uh, you said that you know Indian carriers will grad, you know, graduate to uh, aircraft like the A321 very soon. Yes. When do you see that happening? Do you see some orders coming up? Maybe, uh, yeah, all, all the airlines that have ordered the aircraft from us in India have the option to go to the 321. And we're, without going into their details, uh, we, will, we are in discussion about moving up to the A321. Thank you. Thank you. Next question to Ben Sandilands. Uh, Kieran, uh, Ben Sandler, I'm flying talking in Australia. So we're okay, uh, we're in front of you. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of curiosity uh, in two airlines near where I live, not in the Middle East, yeah. about the prospects of an incremental, a further incremental improvement uh, in the A380 from the 575 tonne version further up. Mm -hmm. They're very, very keen uh, on that that idea. Can you give us any guidance as to what sort of increments? Airbus might be contemplating, or when we might get some sort of further indication as to what can be done uh, with the existing airliner before or if it moves to the uh, NEO. So the, the, the first area that we have to concentrate on when we talk to existing customers with the A380 is to, is to optimize the seat count. And again, to optimize it without compromising. And we do that by, I mean, very very, very small little things, but they, they make a difference. It, where, where do you position the first class on an A380? If you position the first class of the A380 on the main deck, that is slightly less efficient than positioning it on the on the upper deck. So some airlines will transition, you'll see, from a main deck first class to an upper deck first class. What does that then allow the airline to do? That space where today you take Singapore's first class, uh, if that space is actually ideally suited to the premium economy. 
So if you so they might not get an increase in seat count, but what happens is you 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 create a space for the premium economy, which is very premium in terms of its location on the airplane, but it's also from the cabin width and the cabin shape. Uh, the premium economy sits very nicely in, in that area that's vacated by the first class. We also have, through what the question I just answered, where we try and bring some new innovations into how to use the laps and the galleys and the, and the bulkheads and the, and the cabin crew rests. And by moving those things around just ever so slightly, we can create at least another 10% uh, capacity on our A380 without having to compromise at all on the comfort. If we go from the 10 abreast to the 11 abreast, and some airlines are interested in that, we, we've done it because when you sit in an A380 on the main deck, the side walls move away from you. On most airplanes, when you sit on the, on, on the passenger space, the side walls move towards you. So you, you have limited space to, to play with. But on an A380 where the side walls are moving away from you, we're able to accommodate the 11 abreast by pushing the seats out towards the side wall and then not compromising on, on, on the secret. So combining those two those, those elements, one is to look at the, uh, the, 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 the utilization of, of the space, where to put the various classes. Two, whether you go from 10 abreast to 11 abreast, introduction of premium economy, uh, introduction of some of the space uh, flexibility that we put into the airplane. All that improves the efficiency of the A380 going forward as an A380 as it is today. But then from the engine manufacturer's point of view, they're delivering uh, improvement packages, one or two percent on the on the engine side. On the aerodynamics, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it's around 2016 or 17. You get another percent or so from improvements that we, we have done on, on the aero side. So if you combine the improvements from the aero side, the engine side, the utilization of the space and the additional uh, revenue generating classes in the aeroplane, then what we see is that we make the 3T between now and the end of this decade, we make it much more efficient than it is today. So there is, if I may just ask, not any imminent announcement that we might go from 575 tons to 590 tons? No, we with 575 tons today, we already do pretty long range missions. We do uh, Dubai to uh, Los Angeles, yep. which is a pretty long flight. Um, we cross the Pacific from Australia through to, yes, when an airline tells us to look for an extra ton here, an extra ton there, but on, a, on an A320 it's quite easy to do. On an A330 it's maybe not a ton or two tons, but on an A380 because of the size of the airplane, putting an extra ton or an extra two tons in take quake doesn't do an awful lot. To make a difference on the A380, you've got to make, you, we probably have to look at 590 tons and we're not there. We're not there for the Thank you. Thank you. And with you on our time, I have to cut here now the Q&A session. Q here is around for the coffee break, so please approach him. And uh, we have now.